Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Hafadez and Biro, welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. Well, last week we looked at some of the highlights from the 2019 CNMI Women's Summit, which was held on March 29th in Saipan. And today we're going to do more of the same, kicking off with a discussion about women in the workforce and in particular paid parental leave. It's my pleasure to introduce Representative Tina Sablon. Representative Tina is a member of the 21st Legislature, representing the Precinct 2. She serves on the Health Committee and the Ways and Means Committee. Representative Sablon envisions a safe, healthy, and beautiful Marianas, where development raises quality of life for all, fosters community pride, and respects the island culture and environment, where government is transparent, accountable, and responsive to its people, and where all citizens are empowered to pursue an ex- excellent education, gain meaningful work, and participate in civic life. Please join me in welcoming Representative Tina to the stage. Thank you, Erin, and good morning. Happy Women's Month, and uh, thank you all for being here today. Congratulations to the organizers and the hosts. This is an important summit, and It's not just women's issues that we're discussing. This is a women's summit, but these are really issues that affect the entire community, men, women, children, and we really all have to come together to talk about these issues and talk about how we can continue to move forward as a community. So the theme for this panel is representation and leadership. And Rep. Janet talked about the importance of recruiting more women into public office, right? and having more balanced perspectives at at the decision-making and policy-making table. Patty talked about the importance of women in sports and the role that that sports can play in in building the confidence and the leadership abilities and opportunities for our girls and women. And I want to talk about, we could get to my presentation, women in the workforce, and specifically uh, one issue that is so important to supporting and promoting women in the workforce but, and, and retaining them in the workforce. And it's also important for men, and it's important for children and their families. So paid family leave. Why it matters? The alternate title of this presentation is Why it's time to move the Marianas into the 21st century. So I want to do a quick survey here. How many mothers do we have? in this room, raise your hands. How about fathers, raise your hands. Keep your hands raised, please. Fathers in the room, mothers in the room, raise your hands. How many of you, with the arrival of your new child, had to take time off work? Raise your hands, please. And how many of you were able to take paid family time off? So not not annual leave, not sick leave, paid parental maternity or paternity leave. Raise your hands, please. Wow. How much time did you get? 30 days, okay. Anyone else? Very few of you were able to take that time, paid time off work with the arrival of the new child. How many of you had to take care of a sick or elderly family member and needed time off work to do that? Raise your hands. And how many of you were able to take paid family leave for that purpose? So this issue really affects almost everybody in this room. And there is so much opportunity to improve the leave policy that that we offer to our workforce, women, men as well, whether they're in the public sector or the private sector, and I want to talk about that opportunity. So paid family leave. The Bureau of Labor Statistics defines paid family leave as paid leave granted to an employee to care for a family member. So it could be a child, it could be a sick or elderly family member, it could be an adopted child as well, by the way. It includes paid maternity and paternity leave, um, and, in, and it's, it's different. It's an in addition to 
annual leave, sick leave, or other types of leave that employers may offer. So paid family leave. It's incredibly important. And this is why it matters. So for women, it can help a lot to narrow the gender gap in the workforce. And as Auntie Lupi pointed out, women often do bear the burden of taking care of the new child, taking care of an elderly or sick family member. It's often women in the household that, that take on that responsibility. With paid family leave, women are actually likelier to return to the workforce um, upon the, the birth of a child or um, upon the recovery of, of the elderly or sick family member that they're looking after. There's greater productivity when they come back to work. What studies have shown is that men's wages actually tend to go up as well uh, because there is greater productivity overall. And then paid family leave is seen, especially these days, with these millennials coming into the workforce, paid family leave is seen as a huge and an important benefit for worker recruitment, for worker retention, and improving morale. It improves income stability for working families. So for those of you who had to take, I'm curious, for those of you who took time off, how many of you had to take unpaid time off when you had your children or had to take care of? So it's a few of you, right? For so many working families, having to take time off, unpaid time off, is a huge hit for their incomes. Uh, a, a, at least 10% for, for, for the average family. For single mothers, it's, it's even harder. They, um, there have been studies that have shown single mothers can take 40% or more of a hit to their incomes with, with the birth of a child. Paid family leave is also really important for the development of and the health and well-being of the child. And we can talk about that more next. So this is what our workforce looks like according to uh, the last labor force survey that Commerce did back in 2017. So you can see here, women make up just about half of the population. Um, but in terms of the potential labor force, which is ages 16 and up, men and women uh, either working or actively looking for work, women make up just under half, about 48% of that potential labor force. But, but for those who are not in the labor force, women make up 60, almost 60 percent of, of those people who are not looking for work or act or or actually employed, right? And you know, and and, and why would that be? And Auntie Lupi mentioned it earlier. So many women take on these roles that are that are not paid, not in the workforce, um, and and they're they're taking care of their families. But. Having more women in the workforce, creating these opportunities where women can take care of their families, don't have to take hits to their income for, in their households if they have to take paid time off or, or time off, um, actually benefits everyone. And why is that? Women have been shown to bring different skills and perspectives, and valuable skills and perspectives to the workforce. Productivity tends to improve. I mentioned wages improve. Social well-being improves. And women tend to reinvest their assets in food, health care, and education when they are economically empowered. And, and that is also good overall for economic growth. Oops. So I'd, I'd like to just touch on the importance of paid family leave for the development of the child. Relationships with parents are crucial. Those of you who are mothers and fathers, you know how important those early months are for bonding with your child and, and taking care of, of all of their needs. If there are complications with, with the pregnancy, with, uh, with the birth, or after the birth of a child, they, they need a lot more attention and early intervention. And the earlier you can do that, the better it is for the child. Paid family leave after childbirth has actually been linked to reduced infant mortality. Um, longer periods of breastfeeding, which has other positive outcomes for the child, and improved health outcomes for children even in early development. So they do better in school, um, they, they have better attention spans. It's, it's, there are all these associations that, that start with giving parents paid time off to take care of their children. Fathers who take two or more weeks after birth are more involved in the direct care of their children 
nine months after. And mothers and babies tend to sleep better when fathers are involved in the care of their children. So there, there are paid leave benefits for the entire family, right? And, um, it, and paid leave has actually also been linked to reduce postpartum depression and just lower levels of parental stress. So families have time to figure out childcare for when, when the parents are ready to go back to work. So let's talk about the policy in the CNMI, what that looks like today, and why I say it's time to bring us into the 21st century. <laughs> so for the private sector, there really is no mandatory paid family leave for anybody. There is, there is unpaid family leave that, that applies to certain uh, employers, and, we, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but for civil and accepted service government employees, paid pregnancy disability leave is 13 work days. Maternity leave is two work days, and it has to be within, within one week of childbirth. Fathers get two work days within one week of childbirth, but they have to be legally married. That's actually in our regs. I was pretty shocked. <laughs> um, and this does not include adopted children except under the Federal Family Medical Leave Act, and that's unpaid leave. So the FMLA provides 12 weeks of unpaid leave for full-time workers who have worked at least 1,250 hours at, at firms that are at least 50 employees or more. So federal employees do get other benefits, six weeks of paid leave, and that includes birth or adoption, but most employed women in the country do not have access to paid maternity leave. The United States is actually far behind the rest of the world. It's really the only developed Western country that does not have a national policy for paid maternity leave or parental leave. In Guam, pregnancy-related medical leave is up to 10 work days for women, including childbirth, and then 20 days of parental leave on top of that, and a total of 130 days, including all the admin or annual leave, sick leave, and any other and unpaid leave that they might have. The states, however, provide it. It, it really varies, right? So California, New Jersey, Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts are, are there's really just a handful of states that that require paid leave, family leave for for men and women. Um, and for, for upon the birth or adoption of a child, right? So in California and New Jersey, it's six weeks of paid leave in addition to six weeks of temporary disability insurance for women. This, by the way, is a picture of my brother who works in California. He's, and at the birth of their child, I was just amazed. He got six weeks of paternity leave, paid paternity leave, full pay, and, and then he also happens to work for the city of San Francisco, so he got six weeks on top of that. And he had a full year to use that leave, and he took six of those weeks to just come home and spend time with, uh, you know, grandma, grandpa. <laughs> they got to meet their grandson. He got to spend time with his favorite auntie. It was great. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I could really see the difference that it made for, for his family to have that time, have that peace of mind as well, to, to adjust and take care of their new child. And look how happy he is. <laughs> he's, he's actually back here. So they, they came back after they visited last year. They're back again. And yeah, this was just taken like last week. <laughs> um, OK, so how do we compare? I just wanted to show you so you have an, a, an appreciation for how far behind the United States is and how even further behind we are in the CNMI in terms of supporting our working families. So in terms of paid paternity leave, Finland is like way at the top there. They're in ter like relative to the CNMI, they're out of this universe. Paid maternity leave is 161 weeks. So that's like three years, right? Um, in in uh, Japan, Japan offers 58 weeks. And here's the United States way down here. You can't even see it. They're even below the couch. <laughs> Zero weeks. So Rhode Island is one of the states that offers job-protected paid family leave. Um, they offer four weeks, right? And that was, and the, that was part of a compromise. Uh, 
And, and, and this senator, Gail Golden, was one of the sponsors, the main sponsor for that legislation in, in that state. And what she said was, as with all things political, you have to start incrementally with what already exists. That doesn't mean that the length of the leave is tied to a medical standard or best practice, right? So in, the, in terms of the CNMI, what already exists? We have two days of parental leave plus 13 work days plus, you know, all these other, it, it's not a lot, right? But we start with what we have um, and we, we can only really get better from there. So what is the standard or best practice? On average, worldwide, the average is 18 weeks of paid maternity leave um, and eight, eight weeks for fathers. The na there's a national partnership for women and families now calling for this national paid family leave policy. And where do we go from here? So I'm happy to be uh, working now with my colleagues in the 21st legislature, uh, Rep. Janet Maritita, Rep. Sheila Babata, Rep. Donald Manglonia, Rep. Ed Probst, and Edmund Villagomez, who's also here. Raise your hand. <laughs> um, so we, thank you. <laughs> we, we've been having discussions about what we can do to better support our working mothers and fathers, our children uh, from, from birth all, all the way on through. There are also long-term benefits to, to providing this paid family leave so at, at that early stage in the child's development, right? We're, we're building our future workforce, our future leaders, and, and they get a great start when their parents can take care of them that early on and can take care of themselves too. Um, we're doing some data collection. So uh, we're really, at this point, we have been requesting information from the Department of Finance just to get an idea of what the fiscal impact would be uh, in terms of numbers of people who, who seek this type of leave every year, um, and, and we're, so we're analyzing that. And, and we need to do a whole lot more outreach and get a whole lot more public input. Um, you know, because there are some questions that we need to consider more as a community. How long, how long do, is, is reasonable? How long, how much time do families need? Um, and, and how are we gonna pay for it? That's always gonna be the million dollar question, right? In other states and territories, they do it uh, through the, a payroll tax. Is our community willing to consider that? Um, and, and are we, do we want to talk about requiring paid family leave in the private sector too? We have reached out to the Chamber of Commerce. I saw Maxine here somewhere. There she is. <laughs> about, um, you know, continuing this conversation and exploring what might be possible to improve this benefit for our families in both the public as well as the private sector and getting feedback from the business community will be so important for that as well. Um, so, so this conversation will continue. And what I'm hoping for at, after the lunch when we get into our working sessions is that we'll have a chance to hear stories from you, know, you mothers and fathers and caregivers about what you, you needed um, at the time of your birth or sick relative or you know, whatever your situation was, what would have helped you then um, and, and then what, what suggestions would you have for, for us policymakers to consider as we go about drafting this legislation? So I'd like to thank you again for your time. I welcome any questions. Uh, and of course, your feedback is always appreciated. Thank you. We've been listening to excerpts from the 2019 CNMI Women's Summit that was Representative Tina Sablon speaking on paid family leave. We'll be back with more after this break. Did you know that you can donate up to $5,000 to the Humanities Council through the CNMI Education Tax Credit Program? Donations from individuals and corporations qualify and can be used to offset your local wage and salary tax, BGRT, and earnings tax. Call our office at 235-4785 to see how you can support humanities programs in our community and obtain a tax credit for your donation. Sizu Usma Asi, and thank you. 
Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. At this time, we're going to close out our two-part series by going back to the keynote address delivered at the Women's Summit. I do want to mention that some of this content may not be appropriate for younger audiences in case you'd like to occupy them doing something else at this time. Although we're not able to share her full story, I'm pleased to present some of the excerpts uh, highlighting the journey of the keynote speaker as a woman and as a wife. Here is ethnographer and oral historian Arlene Santos Steffi. Here's another story that I've heard, and this is true. This one man said, you know, or woman, I'm sorry, she said, She's complaining about her husband. He never opens the door for me. He never this and he never that. And she said this to somebody and he said to her, change. Change yourself because that's the only power you have. You cannot change somebody else. But if you want your husband to love you, cherish you, protect you, guide you, provide for you, flip the mirror, ladies. When did you stop loving him? When did he stop mattering? When did his voice start becoming like that nail going down the chalkboard? Something happened. Change your attitude. Make your marriage work. Be a good wife. Be a wonderful, loving mother. Because if you do that at home, you will be the best at everything you do outside. It starts at home. You are your first teacher, children's teacher. You're actually your first, your children's first example. If you lie in front of them, if you lie to them, then you teach them. How to lie. If you're not a good wife, you teach your daughters to not be a good wife. My marriage to my first daughter's husband, her father, ended in a divorce when she was three years old. Because he suffered from PTSD, I knew nothing about PTSD. I was a probation officer for the court. Every time that man got mad at me, he took out a gun. Every time he got mad at me, he cleaned the gun. That is intimidation. I know it. He knew it. What am I going to do about it? I wanted my marriage to work, but I didn't want to be, and I didn't want to end up dead. So I started to plan my departure. Dilemma. I knew he's not going to let me have my kid. He's not going to let me walk out that door easy. So what do you do? You may do something different from me, but I'll tell you what I did. I left. I kept a clean house. I fed him. I did everything I was supposed to do. I wanted my marriage to work. But I knew that's not the kind of wife I wanted to be, and that's not a marriage I wanted to save. So I packed my bags. And he got up and came into the room, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm sorry, but this is not working. I'm going to leave. First thing out of his mouth, you're not taking the baby. I know that. Second thing out of his mouth, I cannot repeat here. That's fine, too. I continued. He was upset. He takes my bags, throws them out. I go out there, embarrassed, hurt. Crushed? My whole world was going to fall apart. Did I even think about what would happen tomorrow? No. I could only live for that moment. I knew I wasn't going to take my daughter out. That would be a conflict. I could end up dead. He had guns. So I take my clothes. My mom, for some reason, comes to the window. She's living in the two-story, and she said, Hafadena dosna. Hafadena mi papa. Esta la sonsi. You know what I said to her? Mom, for the first time in your life, please don't scold me. Pick up the phone and call the cops and tell them that there's a 357 Magnum aimed at my forehead. My ex-husband standing at the door, flips me off, shuts the door, 
I get in my car and I drive away. Where am I going? I have no clue. I drive until I end up at my girlfriend's house, knocked on her door at midnight. I need to sleep on your couch. I'll tell you what happened tomorrow. Two weeks later, I go back to the house. We're sitting at the bed with my husband and my daughter, and I'm explaining to her, Mommy and Daddy can't live together anymore, but it's not doesn't mean we don't love you. Who do you want to live with? Empowerment at three years old. She says, I'm going to stay with Daddy because you have a lot of friends. Okay? When you decide to come with Mommy, you call me. That call came six months later. I dropped everything. And I went to pick her up. And I said to her, why do you want to go with Mommy now? She said, Daddy has a girlfriend. She, he was fine. She stayed with him until he was fine. And then she charted her own journey. She started writing her story her way. That, ladies, is empowerment. That's what you need to teach your children. Let them be their own navigators, but guide them. Don't let them get a canoe not knowing where to go or how to steer it, because we all know where that's going to go. They're going to crash. You don't want them to do that. Guide them. I will give you one last experience, and then I will hand it off. The um, I never wanted to get married again. I was married twice before. I knew growing up I was going to get married. I didn't necessarily think I was going to have children, but I knew I was going to get married. By the time I met Bob Steffi, it took me three years to agree because I didn't want to go down that same path. So what convinced me to marry this man? Why is he any different from other men? The difference was I changed. It wasn't always about them. I changed. I learned what a woman in God's eyes should be like. And that there is no more motivating talk than the creator's definition of what you should be as a woman. You can chart your own journey. You can modify anything he wrote. But the very basic part of being a woman is that you are in subjection to somebody, whether it's your husband, your governor, your country, this consul. So if you see headship in a very different light, you will be able to chart a course and a journey that will be successful for you the way you want to write it. And I pray and hope that all of you from this day forward will start writing your own journal, your own way in a successful fashion. It has been a privilege to be asked to come here today. But the greatest privilege that I've received is not to be brought up here. The greatest privilege has been to be embraced as a daughter of the Marianas. Thank you. We've been listening to excerpts from the 2019 CNMI Women's Summit held on March 29th in Saipan. We hope you've enjoyed the discussion. Again, you can find this show and other Your Humanities Half Hour episodes on YouTube at the channel of the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Mm-hmm.